you go to this place in North London that looks utterly nondescript. It's just a house. And then you go in, and all of that nondescriptness vanishes. And you end up in this absolutely mysterious world of ideas. And the casual observer looks at all these books, and it's just pieces of paper, old, musty pieces of paper. But there was nothing casual about that collection. It was this vast attempt to understand the modern world. This vast attempt to understand all of the conflicts and all of the tensions, not just in the world of Judaism, that my grandparents had come out of. My great granddad was a very, very famous rabbi. My granddad had become a communist, but they were immersed in the world of Judaism. But the arguments contained on the shelves of that house and contained in the conversations of that house, they were about religion, they were about politics, they were about history, they were about community. They, they were stories about migrations. Part of the um, story of Eastern Europe migrating westward, or the Eastern European Jewish populations migrating westward to England and to America. They were about the great battles in the early part of the 20th century, the isms, liberalism versus communism, individualism versus collectivism. And they were about understanding urban living because there was something quintessentially urban about Hillway. It was about people who lived and worked in public institutions, in universities, and so on, coming at the end of a workday on the underground to Hillway where Mimi would feed them and give them these platters of food and keep them going with sustenance till 10, 11, 12, maybe even 1 or 2 in the morning. And throughout that time, they would talk. They would talk about these great visions for the future. So here's the challenge as a writer. And I'm going to try and talk in this um, conversation, not just about this book, but more generally about the challenge of creating a narrative, because I understand that this is a creative writing um, invitation, so I want to make sure that we're talking somewhat about just narrative in general. So the challenge is, as a writer, how do you unfold all of these quests for meaning, all of these stories that are competing for attention? How do you give the characters the space they deserve? How do you give the ideas the space they deserve? And how do you do it in a way that takes the narrative forward? Because the worst thing you can do as a writer is you just dump a whole bunch of information. I teach writing in California, and a lot of my writers, you know, they're young, they're inexperienced, and they kind of think it's enough to just go out there and get a lot of information and dump it in any which order on the printed page and hope that magically you get a story out of it. And you don't. You get mess. You get chaos. If you're going to tell a story, you have to work out a structure. It's almost like creating a skeleton for an animate being. You have to create a structure upon which everything else rests. And so the challenge for me from 2010 onward, as I set out to tell the story, was how do you take all of these competing narratives and how do you work out in 300 or 350 pages a way to bring all of this to life? Now, for me, the more I th was thinking about it, the more it seemed to me that there were certain ways of categorizing the information, that this was a story on one level about religion. My great-granddad had gone through the yeshivas, the very famous yeshivas of Lithuania and Belarus, the very end of the 19th century, and he'd been groomed for religious greatness. He was what was called Nilui. He'd been groomed as a Talmudic scholar from very early childhood. My granddad, growing up in Soviet-era Russia, even though his father was imprisoned in Siberia for a while, my granddad reacted against that. And my granddad became a communist for many, many years. And then afterwards an anti-communist, but in a most secular way. And so one of the arguments that's playing out on the bookshelves and in the meeting rooms of the house is religion versus secularism. Another of the arguments is politics. If you look at that house in the 1940s, it's one of the great meeting places for the intelligentsia of the Communist Party of England. As I mentioned in the trailer, it's where people like Eric Hobsbawm and Christopher Hill would go to debate. It's where my cousin Ralph Samuel, who grew up to be a leading social historian when he was a child, it was in that house that he honed his skills. After the 1950s, when my grandparents and almost all of their friends broke with communism, it was a house of liberalism. It was where people like Isaiah Berlin would go. And they would talk about the Cold War, and they would talk about the ideologies of post-communism. They would debate Zionism, and depending at which point in my grandparents' life you approach them in this book, 
You have very different answers about Israel. If you approached them in the 1940s, they were anti-Zionist, very explicitly anti-Zionist. If you approached them in the 1950s, they were kind of ambivalent about the project. If you approached them from the 1960s onwards, they were Zionists. So it's about looking at the evolution and the shifting patterns of ideas. And the third narrative is about the word, the printed word and the handwritten word. And if you looked at Shimon's collection, what you saw was not just printed matter, but you saw thousands of handwritten letters that he'd written, that he'd received, that he'd collected. You found illuminated manuscripts. You found medieval manuscript fragments. You found <coughs> great Jewish artwork from Eastern Europe at the turn of the last century. Anything to do with the word was something that Shimon deemed worthy of collecting because it expressed meaning. It was through the word that you could understand your place in the cosmos. And I think it was through the word that you could get a sense of stability in a very uncertain world. And then the fourth part, maybe the most, the part that glued it all together was community. And this was where Mimi made the salon possible. Mimi wasn't a stay-at-home mother or grandmother. There was nothing stay-at-home about her. She was a public personality. She had a career. She had a life outside the home. But when she came home, all of her energies were devoted to making that house an epicenter for conversation, for love, for friendship, for ideas. And I know many of you have been in that house. I mean, just out of interest, how many people at some point went to Pyre Hillway? I did this in Hampstead last week, it was literally half the audience. <laughs> many of whom I'd never met. Um, every night there'd be 10 to 20 people at that dining room table, and you'd go in there, and if you said, look, I'm just coming for a quick chat, Mimi would say, that's fine, and she'd go into the kitchen, and a couple minutes later, there'd be a plate of duck in front of you, and um, you'd say, well, I just had dinner. And she'd say, that's nice. Say, Are you sick? And you'd say, no. <laughs> the potatoes and the vegetables on your plate, and you'd eat the duck, and you'd get about three portions of dessert afterwards. There was no way to avoid food. And it was the glue that held it all together. So Shimon would sort of lure people in with his vast knowledge of ideas, and his vast collection of books that he was very happy sharing with people. And Mimi would then hold the conversation together, make possible that community. So the more I researched this book, the more I realized that all of these competing things in many ways were lost worlds, whether it was the books on the shelves, whether it was the yeshivas of Eastern Europe that my great granddad grew out of, whether it was the East End of London, the Jewish East End of London that my grandparents lived in and for many years ran a bookstore in. All of these were lost worlds, and so the challenge was to resurrect lost worlds and to find a way to bring on the printed page back to life people and events and atmospheres and textures that have been destroyed by the passage of time, or more malignantly, destroyed by war, or destroyed by genocide. Um, communities not destroyed, but altered by changing immigration patterns. Relationships to knowledge altered, not necessarily for the worse or the better, but changed by shifts in technology. Now, to me, it ties into the much broader project of in-depth non-fiction narrative writing. And I've written on an array of topics, um, from a biography of Obama through to my last book before this one, which was called The American Way of Poverty, and was an attempt to tell the story of millions of people in America left invisible by economic forces, people right on the margins of society, people who had always been and would always be ignored, people who had always been and would always be told they didn't matter, people who lived in places that most media never knew existed, people who lived in areas called flyover zones, somewhere between the big cities that you wouldn't know about unless you went out to look for them. Now, as you tell those stories, whether it's the story of Shimon and Mimi and their house, or whether it's the story of people in Appalachian, Pennsylvania, or people in rural Montana, or people living in immigrant colonias in Texas or in California or Arizona, as you tell those stories, as a writer, one of the things you have to work out is a calculus. Can my characters bear the weight on their shoulder of a narrative? Not all characters can. Not all characters are rich enough. Not all characters have a voice that's capable of holding a 300-page narrative. And so as a writer, one of your challenges is, 
you've got to look for the right stories, the right people to tell the stories, the right events and atmospheres and environments to highlight. And then you've got to know how to pace it. Because coming back to what I was saying a few minutes ago, if you just do it randomly, if you just dump a whole bunch of information, a whole bunch of quotes, a whole bunch of random descriptions down, you don't have a story, you've got a smorgasbord. And that's all well and good, but it doesn't make for an interesting read. And so as a writer, you want to find those vital threads, those threads that bring to life voices and places that are no longer readily accessible. Now, it isn't just about what people say. It's not just about what your characters say, but it's about how they say it. It's about how they relate to each other. It's sometimes about what they don't say. It's about the emotional ticks and the emotional shards that make and break lives and experiences. And so, for me, this was an extraordinarily complicated book because emotionally I was vested in everything. I have my, my writing mentor in New York, who I studied with, is a man called Sam Friedman. And when I was first learning to write long-form narratives, he said to me, you've got to learn to slaughter your beauties. And it's always stuck with me that as a writer, you fall in love with everything you write. You have to. You couldn't write otherwise. You certainly don't do it for the money. You don't do it because it's easy. You write because you have something or you think you have something to say. And so you write these words and you want to keep everything. And you write these sentences and every sentence is a masterpiece to you. <laughs> Except it's not. And a large part of the writing project is learning how to edit. Learning how to self-edit ruthlessly. And even if you're in love with those words, or even if you're in love with those scenes and those passages, sometimes they need to end up on the cutting floor. Sometimes they don't make it into the final narrative. And the longer you spend with a project, for me anyway, the more I found that it's the editing that is the polishing part. The writing, you're creating something rough around the edges. The editing is when you smooth it up into a coherent story. Now, Part of that is learning rhythms. How do you use punctuation? How do you use verbs, adjectives? How do you use the full expressive nature of the English language to bring these scenes to life? Now, anyone who knew Shimon, for example, knew he spoke very, very quickly. And oftentimes it was quite hard to follow because so much information was coming out in this rush. And so one of my challenges was trying to work out how to recapture his voice. Another challenge was trying to work out how do I recreate the love affair that Shimon had with everything printed? Not just the information in the book. You can get that on a Kindle. But the texture of the paper, the smell of the ink, <coughs> the colors of the manuscript, the footnotes, the margins comments, even the signature from a previous owner. What was that telling him? What did it mean? What stories was all of that um, trying to say? What I'd like to do, just for a few minutes, is read you a couple passages from the book. Because I think this is a book that sort of stands or falls, and it's for you to judge, but it stands or falls not just on who inhabits the pages, but how their lives are recreated, how their stories are told. <clears throat> and I'd like first to read you a short passage which is my attempt to convey that sense of absolute delight, almost childlike excitement, when Shimon discovered something new that he could add to his collection. The excitement that Shimon experienced when he encountered a printed jewel was utterly contagious. Friends would share his joy at, say, discovering a volume from the town of Shklov, an area of Medina Russia, the land of Russia, that had been a part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth with a thriving rabbinic culture and a Jewish population of 65,000 until the partition of Poland had delivered the land to Russia in 1772. There, geographically cut off from the bulk of the regional Jewish population, a Polish-Jewish island in a Russian sea, an autonomous Jewish culture began to thrive. As a result of this historical accident, wrote the historian David Fishman, the Jews of Shklov became Russia's first modern Jews. This book is extremely rare, Brad Hill remembers Shimon shouting out. Brad Hill was a um, protege of his. His Eastern European accent accentuated with his joy, his right forefinger wagging when as a young scholar, Hill visited the House of Books to study bibliography with Shimon in the 1980s. Hill, who went on to become the librarian 
in charge of George Washington University's Judaica collection, pictured the five foot one inch Shimon practically jumping out of his seat in his attempt to convey the importance of the moment. All books from Sklov are rare, extremely rare, or as he pronounced it, extremely rare. It was, thought Hill, a worldview as much as a bibliographic statement. What it meant was something like, I have in front of me an artifact from a vanished moment in time, a glimpse into the lives lived by a fascinating group of people who helped in a peculiarly important way to shape the Eastern European Jewish world. And if you are not as bold over as I am, well, I'm not sure we can go on with our conversation. <laughs> and that really was Shimon's worldview, whether it was his socialist collection or his Judaica. It was bringing alive past worlds. And if you could not share that excitement, you probably were in the wrong house. <laughs> I'm going to read one more very quick passage, which goes into something of the texture of these books. Because many of them were printed not just on paper, though even on paper you can see the changes in technology and the changes in expectation over the centuries. Many of Shimon's rarest books were printed on vellum, which was a very expensive form of calfskin that was used for very, very rare Bibles and so on in the 16th century. And Shimon had some. He had a Bomber Bible from the 1520s. And there was this absolute joy, the textural joy of feeling 500-year-old vellum. The leaves of many of these books were made of vellum, a thick, soft, calfskin material that sounded like small waves lapping up against the shore when the pages were turned. Only the very best volumes were printed on vellum. The ink in these pages was as clear 500 years later as the day they were printed. In a Bomberg Bible, even today, one can still see the black lines inked over certain words in the commentaries by Venetian censors, concerned lest anything remotely hinting at anti-Christian sentiment be allowed off of the presses intact. I never asked Shimon how he felt when he touched Renaissance vellum, but given his ecstatic love of rare books, it must have been an almost sensual thrill. Look at the technology, Paul Hamburg said, as he showed me a Bomberg that he had acquired for the University of California at Berkeley's Bancroft Library. When you figure out all of it was done by hand, the straight lines and the columns and the quality of the printing and the fonts, I get very excited. <coughs> Given the awful conditions in which Shimon kept these jewels, Hillway was chronically overheated and the ceilings often leaked. I suspect that Shimon also experienced some relief knowing that these books were built to last. If they were going to reside in an environment as challenging as Five Hillway, it was just as well that they were printed on a material as durable as vellum. Even so, the edges of the calfskin pages appeared mottled as popped by little brown spots as the arms of an old man. Now, for me, part of the mystery of Hillway was that tactile sense that you got when you pulled the book off the shelf. You could feel history in your hands. And you'd open the pages and you could smell it in your nostrils because you could smell that feeling of old material that someone hundreds of years ago had put together into a book and that maybe Shimon hadn't opened in 40 or 50 years. And as you open the pages, the smell of the past would waft up into your nostrils. Now today, we forget about all of that. We think of the printed word strictly as utilitarian. If we want to write something, almost always we email it. If we want to communicate with a friend, we use an instant message or social media system. We go on Facebook. If we want to buy a book, for many of us now, our default is Kindle. We download and we read this matter on our electronic screens. Or we use our iPods and our iPads. Now, in Hillway, you would have lost a huge amount of the wealth of the history in that house if all you had done was electronic reading. And Shimon collected every kind of matter that was printed or that was handwritten. He had letters stuffed in desks. Letters to and from people like Isaiah Berlin or the Italian economist Piero Schraffer. He had collected letters written 100 years ago by people like Turgenev, the great Russian writer. He refers in one of his 
letters, he refers to a Voltaire letter that was somewhere in his house, except it was never found. And I suspect when the house was cleared after his death, that was one of the many historical marvels that vanished. And it's probably a time capsule that somebody who opens a hidden drawer in a second or third or fourth hand bureau that one day resided in Tilway, maybe a hundred years from now they'll open that drawer and they will find a time capsule. And it will be a letter from Voltaire in the 18th century that lived for a while at Five Hillway. Now, understanding all of that, putting all those pieces together, trying to create a picture out of these jigsaw puzzle fragments, that's the challenge of the House of 20,000 Books. <coughs> and I don't know whether or not I succeeded, but I know that if I've even a tiny little bit given you as my readers the ability to understand what Five Hill Way was like <coughs> and what the people who inhabited Five Hill Way were like and what the ideas that inhabited Five Hill Way meant and what the historical personalities who leapt off the pages of those books represented then I think that I will have provided something of a historical read and that's my sincere hope there so I'm going to stop now and before Lala Rushes me off to the train station. I'd be happy to take some questions. Thank you very much.